All right. So as you can see, the Earth Center is really designed to help you maximize your science. And so we're looking for all your excellent ideas. And now we're going to tell you how to talk about your excellent research um, with Susan. So Susan, yay, Susan in person. Thank you so much. This is exciting. It's the first time doing this in person for a while. So um, just trying to think about, okay, how do you multitask when you're doing this in person, but we'll figure something out. Um, anyway, so I, I'm going to follow up on all of those services that Tracy talked about. And one of the things we're going to do today is talk about all the communication services and support that um, the Earth Center can help you with. And before we get there, we'll talk about some of these strategies to amplify your work. Um, so just a little about me. My name is Susan LaMontagne. I've actually been working doing comms with PRE, um, program on reproductive health in the environment since 2015. And I have to say, I feel very fortunate. It has been so much fun. So I'm very excited. I actually started out in journalism, spent many years on the Hill doing advocacy work. And so a lot of what I've done over the years is message development, as well as working with scientists um, here at UCSF, but also through the Robert Johnson Foundation uh, Clinical uh, Scholars Program, which is all across the country. So working with scientists at Yale and Columbia and Harvard and here at UCSF. In fact, we've got an example of one of those. Um, so uh, that's what we do, help you with your messaging. And um, so why are we here? Other than the free lunch, um, a big uh, philosophy is that there are some scientists who feel like, oh, we you know, do our work and it ends up in a journal and that's great. Um, my philosophy is if we don't get beyond that journal and find ways that people really know about your work, how much impact have you had? So especially if you're thinking about any policy change that you're wanting your science to impact, behavioral change that you want your science to impact, then we have to think about strategies that can change how you talk about your science and how, where, where you communicate your science. So four quick things we're gonna look for. Do today um, what, uh, what the media is looking for. So how to identify when your study and your work is newsworthy. Um, you know, how is the media looking at your science? Because I know a lot of scientists will call me and say, oh my God, I've got this study and I know it's going to be big and in the New York Times. It's like, well, we'll see about that. Um, how to craft a clear and uh, concise message, strategies to amplify your work as we talked about, and of course, how Earth can help. And in fact, I think we have a couple of the stars of this photo in the room, Jennifer and Tracy uh, with Sanjay Gupta when uh, CNN was doing this great piece. Uh, on this work and of course profiled the, the great work um, that you all do here. All right, so let's start from the media's perspective. So you have your study and you're trying to think about um, whether the news media would be interested. So these are the questions that the news media is asking themselves when they look at your work. Um, and actually before any of these, they're also looking at whether it's published or not and where it's published. And the reason that matters is because if your study is in something like Nejim or JAMA, they actually have reporters who are designated, they have beats that they follow those journals. Any other journal does not have reporters that are designated to that. So you really have to do the work and get reporters interested. So that's just like the first bar. Okay, then the media is asking themselves this, obviously what's new? And many times, we're actually going to go through some examples. <laughs> I've had some scientists come out, oh, this is really new. And every time I work on helping promote a study, I actually do a Google search on that topic. And invariably, tons of news coverage comes up about that topic. And so how do we figure out, OK, you might think it's new, but uh, we need to convince them to think it's new. So how do we do that? One of those ways is, well, why does this matter? And again, not why it matters to you, um, because it might matter, let's say you're, it, it's, you're, it's chemistry or mass spectrometry, which we're gonna do in a minute. So within the chemistry field, that might matter. But if you're trying to broaden beyond that, how do we get that to matter? Um, who does it affect? And this is a big thing that the media is looking at. Um, for example, if something's really affecting kids, they tend to be more interested. And the media themselves, there's, it's very segmented. So just as an example, Wall Street Journal, they're, they're looking at it through the business lens, an economic lens, whatever they cover. Doesn't matter what the topic is, that's their lens. 
the women's magazines, most of them are dead now, but they have a different lens. Um, then there's the traditional media, you know, San Francisco Chronicle, New York Times, Washington Post. And then you have the you know, trade press. And I know there's others too, but those tend to be the general categories. And then how is it different? And differentiating your work is so important. And I'm, we're gonna go through three examples on that. And what's the hook? And it's really important to find a hook and let's talk about how we do that. Okay. So um, one of the fun things about working with PRE is you guys do a lot of studies that, oh, we found a ton of chemicals in pregnant people. And then two months later, I'll get another call. Oh, we've got a new study that's got found a ton of chemicals in pregnant people. <laughs> so, so here's the first one in a series, um, uh, co-author Dimitri uh, Abramson, who I know many of you know, and here's the headline, suspect screening, prioritization, and confirmation of environmental chemicals and maternal newborn pairs from San Francisco. Okay, so I know you all understand what that means, but the people we're trying to reach, we need to help them understand that what it means. So when you read through the study, and I've just pulled the abstract for you for a second, you can see where this is focused. And Dimitri was completely focused on the fact that this was using a new uh, technique to identify these chem chemicals, the, the mass spectrometry, which I'm probably not even pronouncing properly. Um, and so I'm listening to him, it's like, well, that's nice, <laughs> but I really can't imagine certain media thinking that that's a big deal. And I'm not saying it's not important, but as we keep reading down, what jumped out at me was this line. We tentatively identified 55 compounds not previously reported in the literature. So what's that? Something new. Okay. So here you see on the left, our messaging, UCSF study finds evidence of 55 new chemicals in people. And by the way, this was after a big debate because of whether we could say they were 55 chemicals and know it's evidence of. And, and so there is going to be work with whatever comms person you work with there's going to be back and forth to figure out how to, of course, we want to make sure it's accurate, but we're trying to make sure it's in what I call plain language. I think I should start teaching a class, plain language as a second language. Um, anyway, so here uh, you can see the, the messaging here. Scientists have detected 109 chemicals in a study of pregnant women, including 55 never before reported. We even dubbed some of them mystery chemicals. Um, and sure enough, you'll see that the media, this actually got quite a bit of pickup and uh, literally um, repeating our messaging of these new chemicals, um, you know, previously undetected. And you can see that. Okay. And then a few months later, I get a call. We've got another study where we found a ton of chemicals. Okay. So here's this one, exposure to contemporary and emerging chemicals in commerce among pregnant women, blah, blah, blah. All right, so we read through, and here I literally said to Pre, well, we just promoted something with a bunch of chemicals. We have to figure out what's different here. Well, it turned out when we dug down, they had actually been tracking these chemicals over time. And I said, ooh, okay, well, what does that mean? And Tracy said, well, we found an increase. Boom, okay. So that is an interesting and new piece. So that's what we decided to focus on. That's how we differentiated this study, that there was increasing chemical exposure. And sure enough, lots of press coverage repeating exactly that messaging. Um, and of course, this is also important because it was diverse women, which we also emphasize. And I'm not saying there's just one point, but you do want to pick your first main point, and then you can get some of your other points in there. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Okay, so a third study, and guess what it was? <laughs> a lot of chemicals, again, in pregnant women. Okay, so we read this, and okay, I'm gonna confess the first time I read this, I was like, aromatic amines, what the heck are those? Uh, I think it was also cyanuric, cyanuric acid, anilines, and when I first talked to her, it was one of the researchers who was working with Tracy, and she was so excited about these. And I was like, okay, wh what are these? Where are they? And she was like, oh, well, aromatic amines, that's in hair dye. And I was like, okay, I, under I, just, I understand hair dye. Believe me, I understand hair dye. Okay. 
So <laughs> I'm like, okay, we're gonna, that, that, that might be our hook. Uh, and, you know, melamine sounded familiar. I'm pretty sure I have melamine dishes in my kitchen. I think most people might. So that's where we decided to focus, where we could relate. Melamine dishware and hair dye. So this is what became our messaging, exposed to cancer-causing chemicals in dishware, hair coloring, plastics, and pesticides. And you see that we do not name the actual chemicals here at all in the headline. So one of the most important things I think I can say to you is when you're working on your messaging about your own work, and we're going to do a little um, message ex exercise, yay! <laughs> I'm not going to be the only one working here today um, uh, in a bit. It's really think about what's that headline that would be your ideal headline. And I promise you, if it's in a big mainstream media, it's not something with cyanuric acid. So. Um, identify like where, what, what it's from, why it matters, who it affects. And that's what each of these goes. And then you see um, the, um, some of the resulting press coverage. And this actually got a lot of press coverage. By the way, all of these got quite a bit of press coverage if we do say so ourselves, right, Tracy? Um, okay, and then of course, even the Today Show picked it up uh, on this one. And this is after they missed the last two. So their messaging wasn't quite what our recent messaging was, but you know they finally kind of got with the program. Okay. Um, and in addition, we didn't just do outreach in terms of doing our messaging, doing a press release and reaching out to media. We also used other communications vehicles. So Pre has this fabulous blog that any of you are welcome. I'm gonna do a little pitch for the blog to write for. I see some of our pristine, amazing authors here. Uh, who've had very successful blogs, I might add. Uh, and so this was the one on melamine and you'll see to the right and anybody who knows Ann Saucer, who is our comms person extraordinaire. And that's some social media creative that she developed using a photograph that Tracy took one day, just shopping. And so we kind of did a little wise ass uh, title on there. Um, and my point is when you use these other vehicles in addition to media, Boom. Everybody know what altmetric is? Okay, oh, I'm getting some shakes. Okay, so what people who don't know what altmetric is, that's the vehicle that measures the impact of your study. And in this case, altmetric measures, so they look at the news coverage, how many hits you get, they look at how many blogs it's been, they look at the social media traffic. And in this case, out of, I think it was like 24,000 studies, we were number one. <laughs> Um, so the point being that you want to uh, utilize multiple communications vehicles and you can really, and, and as well as good messaging, and you can really hit high. And in fact, I think another one of those studies, right, Tracy, we were like number three or four was another one. Yeah, we were up there. We were, we were in the top five, I think, solidly. Um, okay, another, another strategy I really want to encourage is if you ever have an opportunity to also incorporate a personal story along with your work. So I know that when you do your research, many times the people are signing confidentiality agreements and so forth, but some might be willing to participate in your study because they know this is a problem and they want to contribute and make a difference. They might be willing to talk to the media. There might be somebody else that you know in the community who's passionate and knows that they're affected. And this was done very successfully by actually another UCSF person, Renee Shaw, who I worked with, um, and she had a friend who had an appendectomy, uh, emergency one, got an insane bill. And so that made Renee decide to do a study and look at pricing for this. Well, we got on all the major networks, huge press coverage for this. And I really believe that one of the reasons was because we had a couple of people, it wasn't just the individual, excuse me, who was behind the original study, but we found others who were willing to come forward. And so we were able to give different people to uh, the networks and we got incredible coverage. So just, I would just say, keep it in the, your back pocket and always be thinking about as you're meeting people, if they might be willing, it's a very, very powerful tool to help you um, maximize your work. Okay, so the second part, we've touched on some of this in terms of messaging. Um, and as you can see, I think sometimes uh, scientists are saying one thing and they think everybody's understanding, um, but you know, the public or maybe policy staff you know, has a whole nother language. Um, and it's really important because one of the things I've noticed is I've seen sometimes scientists even 
presenting at APHA or other conferences. And I've been surprised at some of the questions sometimes from your own colleagues. Sometimes your own colleagues do not understand what you're talking about. So I think it's always better to err on the side of trying to make your work more understandable. I think it's those people generally who will uh, move up the ladder and it's uh, making it uh, more impactful. And then the other thing I hear a lot of times from scientists is, oh, you're just asking me to dumb it down. No, I really believe strongly it's, it's, it's making, it's broadening the audiences who can understand and act on your work is like the way I saw it. Okay. Um, okay, so messaging. <laughs> And here, this is real signs that we're in New York City subway system uh, uh, during COVID. So I, I love this example because it's important because you also want to think about your audience. <laughs> now, those signs work in New York. They might not work everywhere. But anyway, you want to think about your, your audience. So here's the five C's of an effective message. I'm going to add one more six, uh, and that is context. Very often what I'm saying to people is when they come with, with their study is, okay, well, how can we put this work in context that it matters to people's lives? So these are the five things that will help you do that. Um, obviously, you want it to be clear. You've got to drop that jargon and use the plain language that we've talked about. Concise. And this is why I encourage the picking the one main point. You absolutely can have supporting points. Remember the mass spectrometry we talked about before? We did mention in the press release, because it does matter. It, it was a big deal that this was a new, that, but we didn't lead with it, okay? Um, contrasting, how is it new and different? We've certainly just gone over examples of that. And compelling, why does it matter? Uh, and lastly, convincing, is this we're convincing? And that last one, I think, is mattering more and more, as we just saw with COVID, in terms of how are people relating to the message and how we can make it so that it's effective. Um, so a few tips for this. Um, this is actually an old article from an editor, a former editor of JAMA. Uh, I think it applies to this day. So I have the link down there if you wanna read the whole thing. Um, and while she wrote this uh, and you might wanna read it to help with your own science writing when you're writing your studies, she has tips in here that I think are really important for when you go to communicate work. So three that I'm just highlighting here is, for example, um, I get a lot of calls sometimes from scientists, just Dana Boyne the other day, I uh, got a call from a reporter. She says, oh, oh my gosh, what, what should I do? And the first thing is, well, let's think about what you're gonna say before you get on the phone. <laughs> so thinking about what you're saying before you say it. Um, she also suggests thinking in terms of an outline and the more concise, the better. And she has some other great tips and I really strongly encourage you to check out her uh, piece. Um, the other thing I like to look at is after we've developed the you know, message, like your three main message points, is any of those like quotable? Make sure like one, like what's the sound bite? And like, here's an example of one of Tracy's. Tracy is often very quotable. Um, and just always look at it through that lens. Do I have a nice short bite that is gonna be easy for the media to pick up? And is it communicating what I want to communicate? <clears throat> All right, and so the third, we're already into the third section of the thing. We're racing through here. Am I going too fast? Is it okay? Okay. Uh, all right, so strategies to amplify your work, and we've touched on some. So that blog I just pitched uh, for people to write about, one of the things that's been great about uh, Pre's blog, and I'm sure with other blogs, is we have actually generated on multiple occasions, three times last year alone, news stories. So the news media literally is following our blog, and then they will write uh, something about it. So this is a, another great way for you to use other communications vehicles and eventually uh, move up the pipeline. Uh, social media. Now, I know this is, I'm not, I'm certainly no longer going to tell anybody to get on Twitter. I used to. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a little, uh, it's a little dicey now. Um, uh, I will say, however, that it can be, despite the mess at the moment, uh, it can be a great way to connect not only with your colleagues, um, but for example, here, I just pulled a couple screenshots of some of the people who follow pre, we have quite a few reporters. I mean, in, in addition to tons of scientists and our colleagues who are on there, 
we have quite a few reporters who follow our Twitter. And here's one. And then Rob Balot, are people familiar with Rob Balot, the attorney from Dark Waters, who not only follow us, follows us on our Twitter, but tweeted one of our blogs and tagged Mark Ruffalo. So that that is going to be in my obit when I die. Uh, <laughs> she, she, <laughs> Um, it, we were very excited about that. It was pretty cool. Um, but anyway, I do think it's helpful um, to get it. I know it's been he very helpful for PRE in terms of communicating, organizing, and elevating science. And here is another article that I think you'll find helpful that just gives if you are, how many here are on Twitter? Oh, okay. So almost everybody few holdouts, I understand. Um, and this has just some great tips about, first of all, two, two good ones are whenever you use a visual that actually you're playing right into the, their algorithm, the algorithm will elevate and make sure your tweet is seen by more people and hashtags do work. Um, and uh, yeah, and so, and even Actually, but one of the things that I thought was interesting is they're saying that uh, tweets with one hashtag get retweeted more than those with multiple hashtags. So we've actually tried to reduce our hashtag, but sometimes we just can't help ourselves. <laughs> um, okay, uh, another piece is to visualize your science. This is a great piece that uh, Saad Akhtar, who I reached out to, I, by the way, I had never met this guy and I saw this during the big COVID debate and I saw what he did on Twitter and I was so impressed because they were basically look, uh, doing a, uh, a study looking at ma um, mask efficiency. And I reached out to him and he couldn't have been nicer. I said, oh my God, this is so great. Can I please put this in presentations because I work with scientists? And he said, absolutely. So he created this, of, you know, obviously you can see what is somebody coughing and there's the COVID infection going everywhere. So I think anytime you can think about how to visualize your science, think about how much more impactful this visual is than all the writing we could have on here. Um, and so, you know, uh, it's, it's very helpful. Um, and to help you do that, here's another little resource right here. You can take a, a picture of the um, link. I love this piece because they actually attracts a bunch of people on Twitter who do some really creative ways of taking data and um, putting it. So I just pulled this one example. Um, and so this one, she's doing uh, a study on nepotism. And so she's got the handshaking in the suits. And I thought that was genius. So to me, that's the, the bar we're always thinking about. How can we do this with our work and come up with some of these ideas uh, to visualize our work? Um, so going back to some of the other strategies, and also, by the way, these are some of the things that the Earth Center can help you with. Um, here's some social, uh, social media creative. Uh, and by the way, this can be as simple as the one on the right, photograph, uh, a quote, or even just a picture. If you feel like you have no graphic design skills, you can just be posting a picture and then um, a quote. But that one on the right is beautifully done again by our one and only Ann Saucer. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that we can generate for you. Um, and then these are some others. Um, social media in particular really loves anything where you're giving tips. They just do well. Uh, and both of these socials um, did, did very well for us. Um, and then here's just more examples and actually more of Anne's work. As I say here, as I should, Anne, I should have had you come up here and go through your work. Uh, anyway, and I think pretty straightforward. Um, here's from the microplastics uh, report that uh, Pre helped do that was CalSpec's first report. And they didn't have anything to promote it on social media. And so we created some things. Um, and then here you see one just uh, that she created for an Earth Center uh, event as well. Um, and then we also do a lot of infographics and one pagers and your work might uh, lend itself to this. These are particularly helpful. First of all, we can use them on social. Secondly, you can use them when you go meet with policy staff. I'm sure many of you are involved in that. Um, and then even just the colleagues or funders, if you're trying to get uh, funding for your work, so uh, these are also those kinds of things. And then here, um, yes, we also helped 
uh, with the climate psychiatry uh, materials. And this is just the back of those materials and um, uh, Earth connected uh, this project with uh, translators. So, uh, and then we put the translations in. So we had this in Chinese, English, and Spanish. Um, and then another thing, I, again, for those lucky people on Twitter, um, are Twitter posters. And here's one on microplastics also that Anne did. Um, and so are people familiar with what a Twitter poster is? Okay, I'm getting some nuts, some people don't. So literally it's like four slides that are animated, which means you really have to break down when I remember I'm saying your main point and then two or three supporting points, sort of like what your study is, why it matters, what you found, and then where you can find it. This one was a little different because this was on a report and you can see it. Okay, so here's the, the heights of what we found, right? And then read all about it at the report here. And here is another one that Dimitri created um, on one of his studies. So here you're seeing that this is what they, they looked at. This is what they found. Actually, I think I just said that the wrong way around. Um, and lastly, want to learn more? Here's where you can check out the paper. Um, and they look probably intimidating. However, um, and I want to thank Dimitri for introducing me to this, uh, this great resource. Mike Morrison, if you literally Google Twitter poster, Mike Morrison, this will come up. And he does a fabulous little, very short uh, intro and walks you through exactly how to make them. And it actually, he makes it so easy. He makes it so easy that I call up Anne and say, uh, Anne, can you do this? And it's incredibly easy. <laughs> <laughs> Anne does it all. Um, but no, it is easy. And Anne can also uh, create these for you as well on behalf of the Earth Center. <laughs> Was that really bad? It's true though. I'm like, Anne, help. <laughs> okay, but see now everybody's going to get to call Anne and say, <laughs> see, yeah, exactly. I, I, I should have. Okay. <laughs> but you know, no, but seriously, you should watch this because then you'll have region and it is very straightforward. Um, and he talks about how it can be so effective and he has data behind why it's actually a more effective use on Twitter and can be um, leveraged more than just a regular uh, visual. Okay, so now <laughs> we have already hit the time where we're going to do a little message exercise. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is take a few minutes where you can work on your own messaging on whatever research, study, issue, piece that you want to be doing. Um, and see, I mean, I don't, I'm, is everybody gonna be as enthusiastic as these kids for this exercise? Um, and those of you on Zoom can be joining us as well and doing this. And then what we're gonna do is we'll give you a few minutes to work on your messaging and then have a couple of volunteers and we'll put them up on the board and go over them as a group. Does that sound good? I'm seeing some terrified faces and I'm also seeing some game faces. So that's good. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, no, so this is very, so you can just take whatever, like if you're working on a study right now, right? Who, who is working on a study right now? Mm -hmm. Jennifer. I know you all are. You're all working on something or you wouldn't be here. Um, so you've got, you can pick your content and then think about, okay, how am I going to message this? So you are going to identify what your main point is, and then just your two or three supporting points. And you're going to follow this plain language, make sure you're answering why it matters, keeping it simple. And sometimes it works to incorporate an example, but you don't necessarily need to. It's only if it works. So I'll leave this up. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully, I, I hope that what I think is helpful to just kind of write some of this, some of this stuff down and think it through is then just taking these learnings and just putting them to work. And sometimes it's easy as, you know, um, is though, I think a great uh, thing is like what happened with Jess's group. So when she came up to sort of explain it to us, it was like that got me to sometimes like literally figure out, oh, if I have to explain this to my mother or whoever. Sometimes that can be a great way to actually figure out your messaging. 
Um, okay, so here, this is like literally the last thing. We're just putting a list. Uh, we've been going through all these things that we've been showing you are literally things the Earth Center can be helping you with. So consultation, messaging, we've got the whole list up here and everything that you've seen. So I guess I'll open it up to any questions. Anybody has questions? For those of you in the audience, feel free to unmute yourself or put it in chat if you have questions for Susan. And then a lot will go. Okay, Tracy. <laughs> Can you talk about what the effect of having UCSF do the press releases? And when we work oh. with UCSF? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, when, so first of all, UCSF is picky about what they will promote. Um, and they're picky about how they even define a study, right? We've learned that. But when they do select, which means they think there is more news value there, um, and they uh, help put it on, first of all, they'll help us, like, we'll do a draft, but then they work with us on that draft, and they're very good. And then they um, will also post to Eureka Alert, and it always makes a huge difference. So I would definitely say to any, any resource that you can get your hands on, whether it's through Earth Center or through UCSF or through a partner, you know, lab partner or colleagues at uh, institution, you should always take advantage of it. Is that what you meant, Casey? Yeah, it's always, they always do better when UCSF does the press release. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. significantly. Uh, anything else? Oh, any online? How to get CSF engaged. Well, yes. that's it. And that's what engaged. Susan does. <laughs> get UCSF engaged in doing press release. Yeah. Well, I, I just, well, so um, when I did the work with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we were working with tons of institutions and their comms <laughs> people. And uh, my takeaway was while they're very good, they are max out and they have different priorities. So they have a separate set of priorities and it's usually institutional priorities. Mm -hmm. And so it can be very difficult for those with research or with a program to then get in there. Um, and frankly, that was why the foundation invested in services to support beyond that because it wasn't working when it was just the university. So I think you have the same thing here. I mean, they're fantastic what they do and they're great, but they're being pulled in a lot of different directions. And at the end of the day, I think, you know, they have to, they have to put the institutional goals first. So that's, that's just the challenge, but I think you can get around it, right? We, we, we work with it and around it. So, yeah, I would say that they're, they're, they're interested in interesting content and our content has been very successful. So working with the Earth Center to put together the press release and work with UCSF generally, we generally get them to do something. Um, and then it, that just yeah. means that a lot more people pay attention to it when UCSF yeah. puts it out. Yeah, totally. Cool. So that's why we want people to use this service because yeah. we're going <laughs> to yeah. let everyone know about your great science. Yeah. Well, because then we can do some of that work for them and it doesn't put as much pressure on their team. And so it's like we're leveraging. Right? I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? All right. So I just gave, can I give everybody back their 10 minutes on or do you have anything else? Yeah. I'll just have a quick wrap up for everybody. Oh, and web page development. Anne's done amazing jobs with that. And we've done that for different like uh, issue categories and stuff, both on Free's website and our Earth. Sorry, well, last one. I didn't mention that. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you everyone for joining us here and making it to Mission Hall. And for those of you online, thank you for bearing with us um, as this was our first hybrid meeting. Uh, if you have more questions about either Earth Core Services, how to get in touch with Susan and the now very famous Anne and her incredible around, um, be sure to email me, Alana DeLeo, or earth at ucsf.edu. As Southern members and affiliates, you do have um, that seedling funding, which is free, essentially free money for you based on core availability, and that can be used towards these communication services. Uh, also, let's not forget that we just launched our mentored award series. So we're bringing back that client, uh, the 
scientist. Well, that's what we get <laughs> by the scientist and the clinician award. But we also are really excited as this is our true, uh, truly first postdoc offering uh, for twelve thousand dollars for a six month project. You have one month for the application, and there'll be far more information online and on Twitter. So be sure to follow us and um, actually open up those newsletter emails that I send you. So thanks everyone and have a great rest of your day. Great. Thank you. Bye -bye.